say I was like a personal fitness coach that was selling like video courses on this, right? I might go and buy out a bunch of fitness e-commerce brands or maybe a fitness content site and I could use both of the, my two businesses now as synergy to promote each other, right? Uh, we see this all the time actually in the FBA space where uh, like a guy, yeah. let's, say, let's say he was selling jump ropes and he has a content site like an Amazon affiliate site selling all sorts of different health products. He can use his Amazon affiliate dashboard to see what products are selling go source that product himself, change out that affiliate link to now point to his FBA product, and then email his newsletter to his FBA product, and he games the Amazon algorithm just from that. That's a great synergy that's really powerful. Yeah, that's, that's super interesting. Hello and welcome to another special episode of The Robust Marketer. Uh, this is the first in a series of vendor uh, interviews I'm doing where I really wanted to talk with some people I've met in the space who represent you know, really exciting companies doing some really cool things, bringing a new perspective on the uh, e-commerce entrepreneurship game. And so uh, my first thought was to get my friend Greg on. I met Greg Elfrink uh, from Empire Flippers when uh, I was in Bangkok last year. And he sent me a message out of nowhere being like, hey, are you coming to our, our drinks event tonight, our drinks and dinner? And I was like, oh, I didn't have plans for that time. I'm like, I guess I will. And then I basically invited everyone else from Victoria, uh, business related or not, honestly, uh, to join Empire Flippers for a, a lovely dinner and drinks. And it was super nice, super great chats. Greg had just been stabbed recently, so we got to discuss some some fun uh, stuff around I'm glad that. that made, glad that made it into the into the show. Yeah, yeah, totally. You know, a funny thing about that uh, message I sent you, Eric. Uh, you know, I, I, we were atten going as attendees, right? Because we we were a little bit too late in sponsoring it, and I told my guys like we got to come to this event. I was like, well. I'll I'm going to just spam all the speakers on the stage <laughs> on Facebook to come to this dinner. And it worked out surprisingly well. So spam is still alive and well today. <laughs> yeah, it really worked. I'm like, I don't know this guy, but he's talking to me like he knows me. So and he's offering me a free dinner. So let's go do this. Uh, and I met a couple of people in your company. I, uh, you know, we were just getting into e-commerce a little bit more at that time. Um, and, uh, and I was just really interested, you know, obviously as you know, coming from an affiliate marketing background, getting into entrepreneurship, this idea of an exit is something that a lot of people, it's an elusive thing to a lot of people. I think, uh, you get into the game, you grind away, you build up your nest egg. And even when, you know, you're making 5k a day, 10k a day, and then one day you'll lose 10k a day and you'll forget that you made 10k for the previous yeah, 10 days. Yeah. And so you feel there's this sort of constant level of anxiety. So this idea of, uh, being able to exit um, from one of these one of these um, things that you create and and really get a you know get that good cushion exit and then this model of potentially building up things in order to exit them or to buy something in order to fix it up and then exit it, I thought was such a cool concept. Uh, and you know you guys are you know sort of the number like give us the the elevator pitch on on Empire Flippers quickly. Yeah, sure, man. So basically what we do, we're the biggest brokerage uh, in, in the industry now. And uh, basically what we do is you, if you have an e-commerce business or really any online business, so we've sold affiliate sites, SaaS products, uh, you know, you name it as long as it's online. We've even sold Kindle publishing businesses, which I think is a very esoteric business model. But uh, uh, the, the seller comes to us. Uh, we vet the businesses, which is different than doing due diligence, of course. Vetting means that we're making sure it's a legitimate business actually legitimately earning its money, its traffic, and so on, so forth. Nothing weird is happening. And then uh, we will put it on our marketplace and we'll market that business to our list of buyers, investors, institutional funds, portfolio buyers, stuff like that. And we'll actually help you negotiate the sell. So on average, if you, you could go with a private sell and not you know have to pay the brokerage commission, which in some situations is better, but in a lot of times it's not because private sales often won't command the high sales price that a broker who's been doing does this day in and day out can really do. So that's uh, our big value. We basically help people you know take the friction out of buying and selling online businesses. So that's that's our thirty second elevator pitch. That's pretty good, and you've done over forty-five million dollars according to your website. I'm sure that probably needs over updating. fifty million now. Yeah, over fifty over million. We just we just passed that a couple weeks ago. That's really cool. So, what are you seeing in the market? Like, break break down like what you, the businesses on your your site are like. What what percentage of them are they are are, are they e-commerce? What percentage are campaigns? What percent What percentage are Amazon FBA uh, sort of based businesses? 
So if we look at like e-commerce as a whole, which I would include FBA in that, yeah. of course, they're different than, you know, a traditional e-commerce store, but uh, just e-commerce as a whole. So that counts traditional e-commerce, dropshipping and FBA. Uh, I'd say that's like 70 percent of our marketplace now. And about about a year and a half ago when I or even a little bit longer ago, it was mainly Amazon affiliate sites. That was our bread and butter. We still sell a lot of affiliate sites. Uh, so it's just that our deal flow has gone up significantly now. And we've been really, you know, pressing the e-commerce uh, buttons on our marketing, and it's been working well. Uh, so yeah, I, I'd say a big portion of our e-commerce stores. Uh, if you want to break them down further, I think probably like 40% are probably FBA, and then the other 60% are usually a hybrid model between, you know, sourcing your own product and drop shipping. Very cool. And and then what are you seeing in terms of trends right now? Like what what are the the businesses that are that are the hottest? What are the ones that are sort of the most in demand, the most commanding, the the, the highest ratios right now? What like is it print on demand? Is it is it uh, you know health products, things like that? Like what are you actually seeing vertically? Yeah, uh, so it's all over the place to be honest, man. Uh, there's a lot of apparel and accessories uh, kind of kind of stuff. We do see some supplements. Uh, we're a little bit more careful when it comes to vetting those in that. You know, we don't want some like juiced up <laughs> magic elixir on our marketplace. We want our, like a real thing, right? So uh, we, we're a little bit more careful on vetting those. But those are obviously ones that people love because the potential in Nutra is so huge, as you know, and probably your whole audience knows. It's one of those evergreen niches. Uh, but yeah, the, the actual niches run the gamut, man. Uh, you, I've seen some pretty weird items that I would never have thought could ever make money, but I know they do because they've given us their PL, right? So, like, I know, <laughs> which surprises me. Uh, but yeah, I wouldn't say any one vertical is the real knockout winner here. There's plenty of opportunity in tons of different verticals. And you, 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 if you haven't checked out Empire Flippers, go check out empireflippers.com. And I was, I was going over the, um, you know, your marketplace essentially, and just the, the PL, like the fact that you put the PL front and center, even just for internet browsers to see mm -hmm. this business profited this much, this much, this much, this much. Is that, is that profit? Is that profit in that owner's pocket, basically? Is that, that's what that, like that net profit number mean? Uh, yeah. So that's one of our things, right? Uh, we always redact important information in terms of giving away the niche. We're very, uh, against uh, showing the niche unless it's like you know the seller wants to and it makes sense for them like for, for example we had one that uh, does stuff with uh, Shopify as kind of like a WP curve for Shopify it made sense for them to do it that way because the, whoever the buyer is when they buy that asset our audience has a lot of Shopify stores so he gets some free marketing out of it right but uh we try to hide the niche as far as PL, that's the kind of the big sales letter, right? So uh, that net profit is pretty much what's going into their pocket after all expenses are paid. Uh, we don't show what the owner is paying themselves though. So that's what that would be what is called like an ad back, right? So if you're making 12K per month from your e commerce store and you pay yourself 2K per month, that would be an ad back because it's not necessary, you know, it's not required that you pay yourself 2K per month, right? So it's really a 12K per month. Uh, store and so that's what we show in the PL after all the other actual necessary expenses so like your hosting your uh, paid advertising if you're hiring someone to write content like from a copywriter standpoint or even just from you know uploading product listings and so forth so that's what that PL tried to sh tries to show you like what is the actual profit minus the owners uh, or without minusing the owners take home and minusing the actual expenses to run the business very cool so including VAs and you know and any sort of staff yeah, overhead absolutely. goes into that that's uh that's pretty cool. So now what, what does the customer profile look like? Are these people, um, you know, I guess it's probably all over the place. You have people exiting for the first time. Do you, do you have pro flippers who come in literally, um, who, whose game is buying and selling and sort of fixing up these businesses in order to resell? Oh, all, all, all the time. So we have, uh, there's like six main buyer personas and about six seller personas too, but they're, they all kind of fit into one persona a lot of the times. Uh, but we have one we call uh, Flipper Fred internally. It's this guy who come on our marketplace, often it's with an affiliate site. Uh, this is where we first noticed them, but they do it with e-commerce as well. Uh, they'll come in and buy a, buy a store or site from us, and they'll uh, do CRO, update the SEO, like do all this low-hanging fruit. And you know a lot of these tests can be done within the first month, especially CRO, right? And you can increase, like say it was making three grand a month, now it's making five and a half grand per month. And all he did was CRO, then he does a bit of SEO, maybe some paid stuff. And uh, six months, eight months, he comes back to our marketplace and sells it again. I've actually seen, since I've been with the company, we've sold one site, I think, 
four times. <laughs> wow. So, yeah, uh, it's, it's pretty amazing. You know, every time for a higher multiple. And I, I've seen a few sites come back that we've sold. And, they, you know, the uh, these guys, their strategy is they put a, a bunch of money into the business right when they buy it. That first month, basically, because everything is priced on a trailing six month to 12 month average net profit. Right. And that, uh, you'll put on all that work and the real money comes in when they sell it again for a, a bigger multiple uh, with the plus with a higher net profit. They often get, you know, multiple tens of thousands of dollars in net profit plus what they were earning during the months intervening. So it's a great little business model. We call them a uh, little business moguls. So <laughs> nice. So give me some other customer profiles. Yeah, sure. Uh, from the sell from the buy side, uh, there's one called newbie norm, which is, you know, pretty self-explanatory. Uh, they are the people who are just coming into this. Maybe they just found out about website investing. Maybe they have a ton of real estate. They're a mid-level executive at a company looking to get out, uh, by, you know, buying an online business is already working and they, we usually steer them towards more simple businesses. So that'd be, uh, we would usually stress more. You should probably buy an Amazon affiliate site because they're pretty hands off versus the SaaS that has this like whole team of developers that you need to manage. And since you don't know how to do that, we recommend you don't do that. that. By the way, that's another one of the value of using us is that at the end of the day, while we have a fiduciary responsibility to the seller, we still want the buyer to win, right? Because we get buyers come back all the time. So we want it to be a win-win-win situation where all three parties win. Uh, so we do advise you on your criteria and what makes sense. Uh, but as far as another portfolio or another buyer is uh, a really common one, we call them portfolio buyers. So these are the kind of people that will come in and they see a bunch of e-commerce businesses and uh, they buy a bunch of them and they add it to their portfolio and now they can get economy of scale with us certain manufacturers uh, with even advertising. Uh, they might have systems set up that the seller just simply doesn't have because a lot of times the seller might just be you know, a digital nomad guy living in Chiang Mai. And, he stumbled into this dropshipping store, but he has no capital to really scale. But this guy does and can take what that guy's built and expand it rapidly. In fact, we uh, there's one guy who did that, ju did just that. He uh, bought a, I think the store was twenty a $23,000 dropshipping store and in two years turned that like $1,500 net per month to a 30 net per month. And you're doing multi-channel selling, doing all sorts of cool stuff that the seller just didn't know you could do. <laughs> Yeah, so. yeah, and I, I imagine you know when you when you're able to buy, yeah build that portfolio, it, obviously the Facebook pixel comes into play hugely. If you're building you know sure. an audience that's around that thing, it's a no brainer then to to be able to to give your audience a new look, a new company, but still reach the same people who you know will buy these products again and again. Yeah, so uh, with the Facebook pixel thing, that leads more into another persona, which is like strategic Sally, and these are the people who do strategic acquisitions. So say I was like a personal fitness coach that was selling like video courses on this, right? I might go and buy out a bunch of fitness e-commerce brands or maybe a fitness content site and I could use both of the, my two businesses now as synergy to promote each other, right? Uh, we see this all the time actually in the FBA space where uh, like a guy, yeah. let's, say, let's say he was selling jump ropes and he has a content site like an Amazon affiliate site selling all sorts of different health products. He can use his Amazon affiliate dashboard to see what products are selling, go source that product himself change out that affiliate link to now point to his FBA product and then email his newsletter to his FBA product and he games the Amazon algorithm just from that. That's a great synergy that's really powerful. Yeah, that's that's super interesting. So what are some of these other like low hanging things if you're gonna get into this, into the flipping game? So obviously CRO, you wanna get in there, make sure your conversion rate is optimized. Um, you want to, you know, maybe I think analytics is another area that I think a lot of people that leads sure, into CRO yeah. as well, but a lot of people yeah, yeah. Aren't, aren't strong in um, like what are what are the core competencies you want if you want to get into this into this flipping game basically to to really like rev up these businesses once you do? Well, it depends. It depends on what your skill set is coming in. So like if your skill set is you're a hardcore Facebook dude and you're looking at a business that's primarily ran through SEO, you know, you could probably add Facebook to it and it would be great. But, you know, SEO isn't your strong suit versus if you were an SEO dude looking at an SEO site, you could say, oh, I see a million things wrong with this I can fix. Right. So it kind of depends on what your skill set is first and what the business you're looking at is, you know, where, where that business is strong as well to really analyze where you can improve. But I'd say the number one thing, CRO, most people suck at that. <laughs> <laughs> and most people just set it and forget it. Most people just sort of set up their Shopify oh, store, sure. for instance, and just and let it roll. 
um, it's, you know, talking with these experts week in and week out, it's, it's amazing sort of how much people leave on the table, I think, when it comes to, to, to things like CRO, even the, you know, average order value, obviously that's, that's the, the biggest one when it comes to like Facebook ads is you need your average order value to be at a certain point to even be able to mm -hmm. really get into that game. Um, and then, and then obviously like, you know, customer retention, that's the one I feel like a lot of people miss, uh, getting Absolutely. into the e-commerce <laughs> game is this idea of like, you know, it's, it's going to get increasingly harder to, to profit from your first customer if it's not impossible already or, or from the customer the first time, right? The first time you yeah. acquire them. So really, you've got to give them a good customer experience that brings them back sort of again and again. Is this something you sort of impart to your, to your you know, customers? I try to do that very often. You, you know the old saying, right? We've both been, been around the blog. The, we say the money is in the list and we're always talking about the email list and everyone agrees, but it's like telling people going to the gym is good for you. You're like, yeah, that's true, but I'm not going to the gym. Like all these people are like using email lists to bring people back. Like I, I've seen so many businesses in our marketplace that have an email list that they've never even emailed. <laughs> like why do you even have it? Like, but, uh, but yeah, I agree with you, man. Uh, one of the things I tell people is while you can have like a, a, a super hyper funnel where it's like a landing page and you know that whole setup versus like a branded store, you should still have a branded store too because you want people to come back over and over again and start interacting with a brand, not just a funnel, right? And the more you can do that, the more valuable the business is going to be and just more easy, e way easier to sell at the end of the day. So, Do you have uh, many – are you, are you guys much into the, like the influencer space? Do you see a lot of your clients sort of leveraging influencers effectively yet? Uh, you're referring to like influencer marketing, influencer like marketing Instagram specifically, influencers, so like stuff like that. CPA. So, so like the, the, the kind that I'm really interested in is the kind where you're literally making deals with people to be like, hey, I'll give you 40 bucks for every sale of this canvas or I'll give you, you know, like actual like leveraging influencers more like affiliates. Yeah, we do see that. Uh, influencer marketing is popular. It's not as popular as you might think uh, on our marketplace, at least. And I think uh, one of the drawbacks, maybe a drawback of it is that some buyers don't know if they'll be able to do it. Like, uh, like you know, I'm not this guy. He has all these connections. Mm -hmm. I'm just some random dude. Like, maybe I'm a banker somewhere in Minnesota. This guy's, like, you know, in Bali connecting with all these influencers. How can I replicate that? So that could be some issues with uh, that style of influencer marketing. Now, on the other side that you mentioned, like, treating people like an affiliate, we just had an e-commerce store. I believe it went up uh, four or five days ago now. And it's like a six hundred thousand uh, dollar e-commerce store, and it's primary, primary, tr primary traffic uh, source. I can't say that word today. Is affiliates? Is affiliates sending uh, that traffic to that store? So that is extremely like I think that's a great, great way of doing it. And uh, a lot of people just don't think about that. At least from uh, what the businesses on our store don't think about. It. People in your audience are probably like, yeah, that makes total sense. <laughs> I I just see it as this ma massive field. Like obviously, when you look into e-commerce, there's sort of this endless field of opportunity. Uh, uh, you know, it's about finding the, the best parts as well. But I feel like just just scanning the stores in your list, especially, you know, especially for the affiliates in the audience who have, you know, they know how to optimize a page. They know they know how to drive ads ruthlessly. They, they know all these things. So like, and maybe they've built up a nest egg of, of, of you know, money that, they, that, that, they're, that they've been building over time. Like it, it, I, I imagine like someone with a keen eye could look at your business listings and just see sort of endless opportunities to, to flip and to improve these businesses. Absolutely, dude. I, so especially in your market, I, I, when we were at Affiliate World Asia, I was telling you about this, like uh, compared to most of the entrepreneurs I speak with, there's this like clear delineation between our two worlds, whereas a lot of the affiliate guys are like driving insane amount of traffic doing like 15, 20 K days uh, versus my guys is more the slow and steady, you know, brand build. Uh, but the, your guys over in the affiliate world, like if they just switch their mindset a little bit, they can pump out these stores like crazy over a period of a year and a half, two years. They just have to minimize a little bit of just how good they are. Because like if you approach someone with uh, like, hey, man, this, you know, day parting at Tuesday at 11 p.m. on Androids for five minutes, so you, that's when you really spend. You're going to scare away the buyer. Right. So you have to dumb, dumb down your skill set a little bit. But. Uh, yeah, the opportunity is just huge. It's like uh, if you just switch your mind from doing landing pages to building out a real brandable store, which is not that different because at the end of the day, most of these profitable sites, they only have maybe three or five pages anyways are where the majority of their sales are coming from. So it's really not that different. It's just coming with a little bit different of a mindset of, when you, with how you approach it. Very cool. So what are your thoughts on the e-commerce space in general right now? Like there's obviously some big, big things happening. I know 
Facebook is sort of making sweeps of, of, uh, of ad accounts right now. And people who consider <laughs> yeah. themselves even doing white hat things are finding themselves, you know, and I guess it just comes down to the fact that they probably haven't provided an amazing customer experience. And that's really what Facebook is, is trying to screen for as much as possible. But like, what are your thoughts generally on the e-commerce trends and uh, where, the, where the business is going? Yeah, man, there's a lot of interesting stuff happening in the space. It's just a- absolutely exploding. The the ease of entry compared to like, you know, even s- six years ago is so much easier. It's like, you, you know, like Shopify, I call it the WordPress of e-commerce. It's just so user friendly. Uh, but where I see things going uh, specifically in the buy and sell space is I see a lot of sellers, you know, building up their uh, like say they they're an Amazon FBA guy or you know e-commerce or whatever they choose a niche that's uncompetitive that might have a cap in when it comes to uh, how you can scale and expand it. So what they'll do they'll build it up to a certain size. They'll sell that business with us, get that you know 26 to 33 months of net profit up front, and then they would take that war chest to leverage themselves into more competitive markets. Uh, you know when you have uh, you know two hundred thousand dollars selling to spend on a more competitive market, you really jumpstart your brand and get yourself out there a lot easier, right? Uh, on the flip side, with the buyers, what I'm seeing is they're looking at these uh, because usually smaller e-commerce stores or owners are often cash strapped because it can be a pretty capital intensive game, right? They're seeing that and they have the capital to scale this and they know the seller can't. Uh, so they buy these businesses. Um, often they're strategic acquisitions or portfolio buyers and they can do that economy of scale, whether it's through what we were talking about with the Facebook pixel or even through manufacturing and they're consolidating into these really big funds. Uh, there, there's a few I, that I know personally, their whole game plan is, uh, they realize these smaller businesses they can sell for three to four X, you know, EBITDA, uh, which is, you know, over, over annual, we actually use a monthly, uh, multiple for ourselves cause it's a little bit more granular, but one, like once you build up a bunch of these businesses together in a consolidated format and you sell all those businesses, you can sell that business to like a VC fund or something like that for 10 X you know, instead of three X because it's just so much bigger at economy of scale. So that's something I'm seeing on the buy side a lot. That's really interesting. That sort of consolidation where you, where you're building, building the assets together like Voltron. And then, and then, th- then you go <laughs> yeah, to those yeah. those VCs with this sexy giant <laughs> robot and uh, and sell away. Very cool. Tell me a little bit more about about uh, how you guys calculate the value of these companies. Yeah, so there's a bunch of different stuff that goes into it. Uh, I can't reveal everything, of course, because it's uh, pri- proprietary information for us somewhat. But the two biggest things is honestly, like your net profit is obviously a big factor. The higher the net profit, most likely the higher multiple you're going to get. And that's on a 12 month trailing average. So you could use a six month trailing average, but your multiple is going to get hit. So it's not really worth doing in my opinion. Mm. Uh, so always think of it in a 12 month trailing average. So if you, if you're starting a business and you know, you want to sell it, which you should always think about selling, which is, you know, something we could talk about. Even if you don't sell, you should still think this way, but say you were going to sell in 18 months. And you know that the business is value based off 12 months, the last 12 months. So you have those, you know, six months or so to do all your big spending, whether that's web design, testing a shit ton of you know, traffic campaigns, all that stuff. Uh, all the big spending is there. And then as you get into closer to the window of selling, it's time to ramp down some of those bigger costs and you know get your net profit up. But other factors that go into play is. You know, do you have an email list? Is the email list actually monetized? How many traffic sources do you have? Because uh, if you're all SEO or if you're all Facebook, if your Facebook account gets banned, like what's happening to some people, you don't have a business anymore if that was your entire play, mm-hmm. right? So you always want to look at these, what we call critical points of failure. Like how can I, min- what are the critical points of failure, first of all, and how can I minimize those critical points of failure? So diversifying traffic, diversifying revenue, even diversifying your manufacturer, if you're manufacturing the product yourself. I, I always advise that you should have three manufacturers that can make your product because that way the manufacturer can't hold you like in a stranglehold and raise this prices up if they find out that you're the only guy, you're, like he's the only one who can give you what you need. Uh, also, it lets you have some friendly competition between the manufacturers, uh, giving you the best prices. Plus, if something weird happens, like say one of them goes out of business or they just are overloaded, then they can't give you it. Uh, give you the product in time, it's good to have that backup as well. So always just think about those critical points of failure. But yeah, uh, time, uh, length of time, net profit and diversification are probably three of the biggest things for your valuation. Perfect. So you, you mentioned always be selling always, you know, when you start your business, you should have 
uh, an exit in mind, you know, potentially or be building towards that. Like speak a little bit more about that. And obviously the diversification is, is something that you want to have in mind, you know, in the DNA of your business. What are some other things you want to sort of be thinking about from the, from the first day when it comes to selling your business in the long run? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so the reason why I say you should always be thinking about selling, even if you don't, uh, like if you never plan on selling, you should always have the mindset as if you are, because that's going to make your business a lot cleaner. For one, your P&Ls are going to be in better shape because that's your main sales letter for your business, right? Uh, we see this quite often, by the way. So if anyone's out there looking to sell their e-commerce store, my biggest tip for you is get your P&L looked at by an actual bookkeeper don't rely on yourself to do it because even if it's one mistake, and let's say it's a small mistake, it doesn't matter at all, that the buyer's confidence is shaken in you because that's your most important document. There's an error on it, so that tells them what else is wrong, mm. You know what else might be going wrong. So anyways, uh, building to sell, uh, you'll also create SOPs, like standard operating procedures. You're going to be running a lot cleaner marketing campaigns. You're going to be thinking about the brand more so than the conversion, which is often helpful. Uh, and you're also going to ask yourself this question all the time, which I think is a good way to refresh yourself when you're in the grind of building the businesses. Take a step out and ask yourself, if I saw this business on a marketplace today, would I buy this business? And the answer is no, you got your work cut out for you, right? But if your answer is yes, then you're doing it right that you think you are building a real investment. And ask yourself, like when you ask yourself, would I buy this business? Ask yourself, would I buy it for at least 20X of its net monthly profit? And that's a good barometer uh, when, when it comes to, you know, whether you have a valuable asset, you would actually buy, purchase the business. But yeah, there's just a bunch of like, you know, a thousand minute decisions that you make when you have this mindset that makes it just much cleaner and more efficient business than if you were just, you know, building everything just, you know, for the hell of it or whatever without ever thinking about the end in mind. Yeah, super good advice, I think. So tell us a bit more about Empire Flippers. Like you guys, I know you guys are growing like crazy. I think, yeah. right? Like, like you guys are like, how, what do you account? Do you just, do you, do you feel you're, you're like, you're just sort of on the back of this huge e-commerce boom and it's sort you're just a, you know, you know, you put yourself in a, in a really good position on the back of the boom or like, tell me a little bit about the growth of the company and, and what that's been like. Yeah. So we, we've actually been around since 2011. Uh, we started off as an outsourcing company, weirdly enough. Uh, basically what happened is one of the big outsourcing clients left and we had this whole team in the Philippines. Uh, like, what are we going to do with them? And our uh, founders, Justin Joe, were like, well, I've heard about building these niche sites. Let's fill their time with that until we get more clients. And what ended up happening is that we would sell these little AdSense sites, They're very small sites, like $50 a month, $100 a month earners. And we'd sell them on Flippa, which is the, you know, the only place that really existed back then for this kind of stuff. And uh, we blogged about it, you know, very transparent. And eventually what happened, we were selling so many of these sites that people in our audience were like, hey, man, you have this super awesome Flippa audience. Can you sell my site on your Flippa account? I'll give you 15% commission. I'm like, oh, that's an interesting idea. <laughs> and so uh, eventually what happened is we started getting a ton of these people and we decided, you know what, we're just going to become a, a business brokerage. So we've actually been around for a few years. Uh, to answer your other side of the question with the uh, e-commerce store, or, or with the e-commerce boom, we do see it booming very strongly. And we like, it just kind of happened naturally where a lot of e-commerce store owners came to us from our presence with all the other stuff we've sold. And we've just really uh, been maximizing that. I also think versus like some of the other brokers that are out there, our, our process is just better. So uh, a typical broker, they'll have like, and they'll sell you on the white glove treatment kind of thing because they have one broker that does everything for you, one contact. You know, that's the flack that we get sometimes is that you're talking to so many people. But really, that's the benefit of our process is that every step of the way from vetting to listing to you know the negotiations, we have an entire team in place to handle that process for you. So we're very process driven. So I think those that combination of two things has been super helpful in our aggressive growth. And yeah, we just hired 11 new people and we're hiring like eight more people in the next couple of weeks. So wow. <laughs> Yeah. It, it, well, you guys have a really good combination because you have that sort of like, I'll spam all the speakers on the Affiliate World Europe thing, <laughs> but when they show up, they can invite all their friends and I'll show them my stab wound. So, <laughs> so you guys have the white bloody glove treatment that just people just really love. Uh, it, yeah, it's, much, it's way better. <laughs> it, it was a very endearing first meeting, I have to say. Um, but you're all healed up now. All good. No more. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, they look like angry cat scratches now, but it, you know, it's funny. Uh, 
at Affiliate World, there was this uh, girl that came up to me because I, I was wearing the shirt I actually got stabbed in because uh, I thought, what's a good way to get an icebreaker going? I don't know anyone here. Uh, like this shirt might, uh, might, you know, they might ask a question. I won't bring it up unless they ask me what these holes in my shirt are. And, uh, and this one girl, she found out because she overheard me talking to this other guy making a joke about it. And she's like, oh, my God, I got to heal the negative energy in you. I was like, oh, okay. So she put her like hand on my shoulder, like, oh, this is more awkward than when I got stabbed. <laughs> I didn't want to say that to her, but, uh, but yeah, man, uh, it, it was great meeting y'all, you guys at Affiliate World. Uh, it was everything that I thought it was def- it was definitely going to be. Uh, I'm glad that my Facebook spam tactic worked out so well. <laughs> yeah, no, it, it did for both of us, I think. So you'll be back in Barcelona, right? You guys will have a presence here at uh, e-commerce Mastery Live and uh, at the uh, at the Affiliate World Europe event. Yeah, so we're sending, I think, uh, three or four people because, you know, it's such a big event that I, I wanted to be pretty well covered. Obviously, I'm going to be at uh, Affiliate World Bangkok, of course, so we'll maybe have another Al Gacho dinner together. <laughs> nice. And you, you're you based in Bangkok, right? Uh, I actually live in Vietnam most of the time, uh, so Ho Chi Minh City, but I, I live in, you know, I'm a digital nomad, don't really have any one place I call home. Uh, right now, I'm in Vegas, I'll soon be in New Orleans, Alaska, back to Vietnam, and I just flew from Boracay. In fact, that's why we had to delay this because the internet was so terrible at Boracay. I would not recommend to do a work retreat there. That was bad foresight on our part. Yeah, unless you really want to unplug and just have face-to-face yeah, meetings. Yeah. I've, I've ran into, we, our team is in Manila. Uh, and so so we've had a few vacation chats that, that never happened, uh, which is good because when you're in, maybe when you're in Boracay, you should just unplug anyway. Uh, yeah, yeah. But uh, but very cool. Nice. One last thing I wanted to cover about you. This is totally unrelated to business and everything, but you're you're a poet as well. You're a writer and a poet. I uh, I am. Uh, I, I think this is my about us. Uh, my in my profile, I say I'm moonlight as a novelist. You know, uh, I've been writing since I was in fourth grade and uh, writing has always been something I loved. So I'm a big literature nerd. So, yeah. Nice. What's your favorite book? Uh, Blood Meridian by Cormac McCarthy. Oh, oh I've read it. Have you? Oh, I've read, oh, wow. I've read a lot of Cormac McCarthy. I'm a huge Cormac oh, McCarthy fan. He's one of my fan. favorite writers. I was just oh, going wow. over my bookshelf and I kept all my Cormac McCarthy books. Have you ever read Sutri? I haven't. Sutri? I, is that him? It's like a 3,000 page novel that's written in this like particular southern dialect drawl that like isn't really English. <laughs> and it's just like Clockwork Orange. It's like when you read it, you, you, you don't understand it for a long time and then it eventually like marinates you and then you fully understand this. Uh, this story. It's a really, yeah, Cormac McCarthy, anyone out there in the audience looking for some, some good fiction, Cormac oh, such, McCarthy such a great is writer. probably the best living American writer, I think you might be able to say. I, I'd, I'd agree. If, if anyone out there has no idea who he is, you probably have heard at least one of his stories, which is No Country for Old Men, that was you know made into a movie. But for you, Eric, since you read Blood Meridian, I would highly recommend you Google Home Alone Cormac McCarthy uh, Blood Meridian style. This guy is a f- big fan of Cormac rewrote the entire screenplay for the first Home Alone in the same style as Blood Meridian, and it's hilarious. It's like one of the most hilarious things I've ever read. Oh, man. It's definitely a treat. The, the <laughs> judge. I just remember the judge in that book and what, what an amazing character he was. Oh, uh, sure. What about this? Is a, We're just geeking out on literature now, but what about uh, ever read Infinite <laughs> Jest? I haven't. Uh, I actually think I heard you talk about it on another podcast. It's on my reading, like to do reading list. I, I haven't ordered it yet. It's another epic beast of a book, but it's uh, yeah, it's uh, David Foster Wallace sort of postmodern epic about uh, about entertainment and Quebecois wheelchair terrorists and all sorts of bizarre <laughs> bizarre things. But uh, so interesting. This this will be the high culture contingent of the the robust marketer podcast. Uh, so yeah. high brow, low brow, all, about, all at once getting stabbed, getting you know, spamming, stabbed, talking about Corbin spamming. McCarthy. <laughs> I, and now I just listen to Russell Brunson podcast that he does from his car, just so I can understand how to how to create better hooks. But uh, <laughs> but I like to mix it up with the weird stuff too. Well, nice, Greg. I really appreciate you coming on the podcast today. Um, if people obviously want to get in touch with you, they can check you at uh, empireflippers.com. Uh, any yeah, other things uh, you recommend? Yeah, if anyone's out there, if you have a, a you know want to get in touch with me personally, it's just Greg at empireflippers.com. You can also add me on Facebook. Uh, I think my URL is like facebook.com slash Gregory the writer. <laughs> so uh, I'm addicted to Facebook. You can usually always hit me up on there. And I'm sorry in advance for all my poetry on my page. Don't <laughs> apologize. I always give it a scan. I always enjoy it. I, I think it's, it's cool <laughs> that you're putting that kind of stuff out there, right? Like it's easy to get. So, you know, my Facebook feed is just all 
marketers. It's just pretty much all marketers now. You mean all all crypto people? Oh uh, well, actually no, <laughs> they're, they're pretty quiet. They're a little more quiet. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they're a yeah, little more quiet true. these days. But uh, yeah, no, a lot of marketers, <laughs> a lot of gurus. Uh, so every time I get one of your your poems, it's a breath of fresh air. So so don't stop doing that. Don't apologize for it. I think I might start actually, some beat poetry myself. Uh, oh, sick man! I'd love to read it. Yeah. This is my this is how I do influencer marketing. This is how I got on the podcast. I wrote you a nice poem. That's right. That's right. Okay, man. Well, good chatting, and uh, we'll be in touch soon. Hopefully, I see you in Barcelona, and if not, I'll definitely catch you in Bangkok. Yeah, for sure, man. I I look forward to it, and thanks for having me on here. Okay, bye.